Hello everybody, co-owner Om Gandhi here. Welcome one, welcome all to the audio edition of the Fireside Chats. For more stories like this, go to our website at runtrymag.com. That's runtrymag.com. You can also find us on Instagram at runtrymag. And you can also find us on Facebook at runtrybike. And now, on to the show. Perfect timing. Uh, here is Om Gandhi, one of our co-owners, and Kim Critshaw to join us in our fireside chat on our typical Tuesdays. Kim, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I, I, my introduction ran a little long because my list of things that I had to say about you just never ended. I think I might have run out of ink, actually. All the letters behind my name, I think, add up to be more, more than my name. So it's like... <laughs> I, and I I made sure to pronounce your last name uh, properly twice so that I wouldn't forget it going forward. Crapeshaw, folks. It's Crapeshaw. Crapeshaw. I appreciate it. Awesome. So because you have so many different um, areas of life that we can talk to you about, we're going to make this a chat and a lot less Q&A in a way. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in, you know, and for those of you at home who don't know, I teach uh, business and marketing at the college level, is I'm interested in your world as a business owner, especially in the endurance sports space, because that's obviously where we operate too. So when did you start your business? What do you focus on? What are you trying to accomplish with your business? Awesome. Great questions. So I have been a dietitian since 2008. <clears throat> um, did all my education and went into sports dietetic at the university level, working in the wellness center. Um, so I've always been working in the kind of realm and then I've always taken clients on the side from like full-time jobs working in the hospital. So I finally became officially official in LLC and all that jazz, um, in January of this year, even though I've been seeing people on the side, but so it was a big undertaking, um, you know, putting the website out, making, um, marketing and all that good stuff, like finding out who my ideal client is because you, you really can't help everybody and you shouldn't try to help everybody. If anybody's listening and has business or he needs a business advice, that's the biggest thing. Is I'm going to students watch this video tomorrow because it's exactly right. Yes. Like you can't, you can't please everybody and you shouldn't try to please everybody and you're not going to connect with everybody. So really like dwindle down like who your ideal client is like, you're making a post, who are you talking to? You can't just be talking to everybody. Um, so really finding out who I wanted to work with was kind of the struggle because of course me being a helper, like I wanted to help everybody, you know, you're like, Hey, I'd like to just bring everybody together. Uh, you know, we're all like hand raising, like, help everybody. <laughs> but really finding out like who you can connect and jive with. And so mm -hmm. that, is kind of the biggest thing and so i really just figured out that i just really want to help women sorry guys and i'm more than happy to help guys i do um relate to some of them and i mean not you know some of them but you get what i'm saying i we're relatable we can work together but really i um have that strong bond with women understanding where they're coming from um time crunches trying to do multiple things at once um being overweight because i was um I was overweight for a while you know like we've had these conversations like I was a big girl for a little bit who was a little bit down on her luck and down on her life and happiness wasn't there and I have those relatabilities so I think it's really important that women really learn to empower themselves again through either working out or through nutrition or through mindset and all of that stuff to realize that they are beautiful creatures who are extremely important to this world and need to really learn to love themselves again. I'm going to guess the answer to this question is yes, but uh, as a dietitian and a running coach, are you working with the same person under both umbrellas? Do you offer one versus the other or or are clients coming together under um, just the one umbrella and doing both with you? So there is multiple options. You can do strictly nutrition with me because a lot of people don't need to tackle both at once, um, especially if they're just starting. <laughs> Let's say they've never moved, you know, they've done a, never done a 5K, never actually watched what they've eaten. I don't want to overwhelm them 
because then they shut down. So some people, I will just say, let's just start with whatever you think is easiest for you to control right now. And that's usually nutrition. Um, but sometimes it is like, let's get on a movement program. Maybe they do want to train for their first 5k. So maybe we'll just train for their first 5k. Um, but then there are those powerhouses who are ready to take on both and they have to fill out an application before you work with me to make sure that you are ready in levels of motivation and even you can start and have an appropriate time frame to work with me and you have the appropriate finances. Like we don't want to be like, yes, come work with me. It's a bajillion dollars. Oh, wait, you can't afford it. Right. So I do both. You can do both combined or you can do one separate or one the other. Um, but yeah, all of it's available through me. So do you, as an athlete now, feel pressure because you're also a business owner coaching athletes to either through both, you know, food consumption as well as physical training? Yeah. Um, sometimes, like, I have imposter syndrome because I haven't run that 100 miler yet. So I'm like, I can't coach people on this if I haven't done it yet. But then I'm like, wait a minute, I have the tools. I've just had setbacks in my own. And sometimes you don't achieve things on the first go. But as long as you take nuggets and learn from it, then there's no reason you can't teach other people. So yeah, I get imposter syndrome sometimes because I'm like, Ugh. or sometimes if I eat something terrible and I'm like, oh, my clients are gonna see this. But <laughs> my, uh, my coach uh, has, coach 10 people including me the 300 mile finishes and the most she's done is 100k and right. a few times Ronnie's. so like i definitely get that if you're good you're good and if you know how to get people to push those limits then you can absolutely do it but i i definitely feel confident in my ability to coach someone but i'm just like i can tell you what not to do in a hundred miler um but yeah so it, it, it gets that struggle but the way i teach with nutrition is that Every food fits. There's no good or bad. So when I'm eating a donut, I don't feel bad about it. But I know my clients are going to be like, I saw that. And I'm well, like, they, you, you just made me laugh because wait till they see when our digital magazine drops. Because one of the images we have associated to your article is donuts. Like I specifically searched it out because wait, of that. You didn't put muffins and cupcakes? Come on. Oh, there's some kale and quinoa at the top of the header picture. But yeah, then there's going to be donuts too. I yeah, we're super excited for that article. Could you could you state that again for the people in the back? Because that's something that, I mean, we talked about it earlier too. Relationship with food, like the eighty twenty rule. Like, um, could you state that louder for the people in the back? Yeah, um, all food fits. Um, you know, unless it's like drugs. Like, we don't want to do cocaine and anything like that. But food fits like there's no good or bad food every food has a calorie associated to it unless it's something like celery where it's just fiber and water and you you know burn more calories eating it but every food has calories which means your body can use that some way now we might not like the way we use it because it might just take it and store it as fat and we're like let's not do that but our bodies know that we might need that energy later. So all food fits. All food is important for us. And it might not be for nutritionally for a moment. It might be emotionally. Um, but we need to get past the stigma of this is a bad food and this is a good food. And I can only eat good foods because these are green lit foods or whatever. There's so many things out there that label foods. And it just gives these people anxiety over what they should eat. And we shouldn't be having this much anxiety over nutrition. It shouldn't be that painful of an experience for people so all food fits 80 20 is an amazing rule to follow especially if you have performance um goals or maybe even you have weight goal goals whatever your goals are you know you just need to move your things around to fit those goals but if you're just trying to live a well-balanced healthy lifestyle eat the gourmet donuts because they're delicious and you could get hit by a bus tomorrow and you're gonna be really ticked off that you didn't eat that donut you know that's, that's how I my, live my <laughs> That's my theory when it comes to bread. Like, I am eating bread. Like, don't tell me not to eat bread, the carbs this, the carbs that. Like, marble rye, pumpernickel, you know, sourdough, baguettes. I don't care. I love bread. And I'm going to eat it. It's good for me. It makes me feel good. As long as it makes you feel good. Now, if I eat a massive amount of bread, it's not going to feel good. So I like, <laughs> but I really do want to eat, like, a ton of it. I'm like, this so is delicious while it's going in but yeah um, there's there's a restaurant around here a coffee shop called the Lux, and they actually have an item on their menu called bread and butter 
And I thought, okay, it's like, you know, one or two slices of bread. It's like a loaf. It's the greatest thing. Like, I just go there. I'm like, can I get the bread and butter? It's like a stack of bread and butter. Yes, it's thanks for the invite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to eat bread. No. I mean, the only foods we should ever avoid are foods you're allergic to and foods you're super sensitive to. Like, those are the foods that I'm like, all right, we don't need to eat those. Like, don't, like, eat a shrimp and EpiPen yourself, you know? Right. But all, every other food fits unless you have an allergic reaction to it. Designed for running adventures on a variety of surfaces, the Catula Exospikes footwear traction are at home on ice and snow as well as on dry, rocky ground. 12 ultra-durable tungsten carbide spikes provide an impressive amount of grip when you need it and stand up to rocks and other abrasive trail features when you don't. Exospikes will inspire you to follow the trail less traveled, even when it's covered in ice. For more information, visit Catula.com. Kim, one of the things you were talking about was coaching and how you hadn't coached a, an athlete and had not done a 100 miler and the imposter syndrome. And, and I kind of feel the same way because... I run 50 milers up to 250 milers now, and I get athletes asking me about um, coaching them for marathons and half marathons. It's a whole different mindset, right? So when you go through that practice of coaching those athletes, what are you looking to make sure you highlight on their training program that you can speak to even though you hadn't crossed the 100-mile finish line? Yeah. Um, a lot of times it's I'm looking for um, mental um, you guys know part of running those longer distances, you know, we can slow our bodies down, but our mind starts playing tricks on us. So a lot of it is time on feet. Like, are they making sure they're getting their time on their feet? Um, you know, if they're just putting in like two hours here and there, and I'm like, are you going to do like the world's fastest hundred miler? Like, what are we doing here? Um, and then also before I even take them on, I kind of have a conversation about what a hundred miler or a long distance entails. Like this is, this is a multi-day event, unless you're super fast. Um, this is going to take you an overnight. Do you have time to dedicate your schedule to training that? Um, you know, is your family knife going to be taken care of? Your sister make another going to enjoy this or so participate or support you? Um, because everyone knows training for these long distance events is time consuming. Um, not just for yourself, but everyone around you. So sometimes you're putting in a lot of morning and everything else. So a lot of it's time. Do they have the time and, and the ability to do it? Um, have they done anything like this before? Um, have they put their bodies through these limits? Because a lot of times you can take in a triathlete and bring them over because they've done an Ironman. So they're used to a 15, 16, maybe even 17 hour day um, if they're back of the pack. So all of those questions. And then we kind of talk about things like pace, like what are they looking for? We start diving down into it. Have they had nutrition problems with endurance events? Like all of that's good fun stuff. Um, so it's very, um, not hand holding, but very hands on. Like I'm not just like, here's your plan and goodbye. Like it's, how are you fueling? How are you feeling? Um, is it something you can really realistically take on this year or do we need to just shorten you down to a shorter race and take this on when you have more time? Um, so it's, it's very, very thought, <laughs> thought filled. <laughs> uh, it's just meeting them on their level where they can kind of grow and become that athlete you want them to be. Um, so that's kind of fun. You mentioned triathletes, and so you you can carry the the monikers, titles of Ironman, OCR finisher, ultra runner. Your favorite one of those is? Um, honestly, I like the twenty nine or twenty nine event more than anything. Honestly, uh, I very quickly retired from Ironman as soon as I did it. <laughs> <laughs> consuming you know it like really is i was in the pool five days a week at 5 a.m i would go to work and then i would come home from work and ride my bike or i'd run or do something or keel over and die and try to eat some food and then on the weekends your time consumed like it's just it's chaos and it's just a lot to do so i thought ultra running would be easier and there's just as much gear for ultra running that yeah. brings me to a question actually um so 
I was wondering, since you have all these different monikers, like ultra running, like 29, 29 finisher, uh, triathlete, CrossFit, uh, which one came first? Uh, okay, so I've been an athlete all my life. I played softball from a very early age into college where I walked on and then <laughs> very that later that semester walked right off because it was very time consuming. And I was like, no, thank you. I'm here for an education. Um, because I wasn't going to go anywhere else, you know, like women's softball. I think there's the USA team and I don't know, but it, 20 years ago, there was not much else for women to do after college playing softball. So I needed education first and that was what I needed to do. So uh, I was softball for life. And then I grew out of athletics in college for a while. And that's where I gained my most weight. Um, and then I decided that I should take up running because why not? I hated it all throughout, throughout being younger, but running was the easiest thing to do. You just needed a pair of shoes and you just went. Um, and so I took up running first and just did probably about, I think I've done at least 40 half marathons now. Um, I ran. I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I ran with team in training first, and that's how I did my first half marathon with, was Nashville in 2008. Um, so I loved fundraising for them, and I loved the coaching they had. So then I actually became a coach for team in training for a little bit. And then I went from running to OCRs and did that for a while. And then I went to triathlons, very quickly retired in 2017. And then in 2019, I ran my first ultra. Awesome. And, you know, you mentioned earlier to me that, uh, well, you just mentioned it now that you hated running. So what was different? Uh, what was different this time? What was the catalyst for you picking up running besides, you know, like the fact that you mentioned that it's something that you can easily just put shoes on and get outdoors? That was pretty much it, honestly. Like, <laughs> I was, <laughs> it's easy to do. Um, uh, in college, I was dating kind of a uh, not fun person who I gained a bunch of weight because it was just really restrictive and a bad abusive relationship. So getting out of that um, and kind of being set back on my own, having to take care of myself financially um, and everything else, I was like, well, what can I do? And so it was like, well, I can run. Um, and so I just took up and it was literally like, I was 185 pounds, which on a five foot eight frame isn't that bad. If you're muscular, if you're just fat, it wasn't that great. So I would literally start it off with going to the gym and running on a treadmill for one mile and then leaving. And that was my checkbox every day was to run a mile on the treadmill and then leave. And then afterwards, when like that felt comfortable, I would do a little more. Um, so I literally had to like rediscover myself on my own, um, which was kind of, neat and a little scary but i built myself back from where i was just being on a treadmill and running um, how did so, that so how did that eventually lead to you going uh, the, that you wanted to run your first half marathon i mean I'm, it might be rhetorical in a way because we're all you know endurance athletes here and it's like a domino effect but i'm curious okay. to hear firsthand like your experience of how it led to a half marathon running was hard um, I've had chronic knee problems since I was younger and they thought it was cause I was a little roly poly kid just working myself too much and had like knee problems. Um, and so running was hard and it was complicated and it wasn't easy. And I thought that kind of in order to become an actual runner, I needed to have a medal and I needed to do an event. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I was like, all right, that's it. We're going to run a half marathon. And I chose one of the hilliest freaking half marathons for a flatlander to try to do. Um, so which I was, so I went to Nashville, which was just rolling hills when you're just running on nothing but flatness in Mississippi. I was in South Mississippi at the time and I'm running, I went to, I trained on no hills, zero hills, and nobody had the audacity to say, hey, we're going to be running on hills, guys. Maybe we should train for it. No, they're just, <laughs> <laughs> so I get to Nashville and I was like, what is this? Um, yeah, so I did it. It was really slow, um, but I got it done and I moved and I, you know, but then I was like, oh, we can do this again. Um, let's try this again. Uh, so I just kept doing them because they were available. And if you guys remember 20 years ago, half marathons were pretty cheap. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> Like, all right, 50 bucks, let's go do this. That's right. 
And now it's like $200 and you're like, for, for what? I'm doing, this is a training race for me. This is 13 miles, guys. <laughs> it's amazing how, how from the business perspective, how the pricing has changed so much. And I don't hold it against RDs because we've talked to them and permits and insurance and EMTs and fire and police, like it is astronomical. I think the RD for Boise Running told us that the cost for shutting down downtown Boise next year for their half marathon marathon was going to be like $400,000. Like just something astronomical. Astronomical. <laughs> That's, it is insane. Like the amount that goes on behind the scenes that everyone doesn't yeah. see out when they're like, oh, yeah. Bucks or 250 bucks for a race, like the permitting alone is just jumping through circles and squares. You're like, which one do you want me to jump through now? Like, what do I need to prove to you that we can have this event? And then, you know, if you are getting, you know, EMTs out in the middle of like BFE, like we hold our races out in the middle, you're holding your phone around, like, do I have signal? And you're like, oh, if I stand, I have signal, don't anybody touch me. Um, yeah. <laughs> like that when you're going through you know parks and you've got to get gates opened and closed and this and that when you've got to shuttle people around and all the companies now like porta potties the, the price of porta potties has gone through the roof and nobody thinks about it at all and i'm like 25 of those dollars you just paid went to go to the porta potty so please use them well one of the things you said is you're the captain of captains in our in our pre-meeting conversation and you know coordinating volunteers and everything like that and there's only but so much that you can do. And if a volunteer forgets to shut a gate or shuts a gate too soon, for argument's sake, and the athletes come up on it, that becomes a complaint. And it's like, look, we're all still human beings here. Like, have some grace to be like, hey, the gate was closed or it was open or whatever it was. Just wanted you to know. Didn't inconvenience me for more than, like, seven seconds. Because we've seen the complaints that RD's get. And it's outrageous. Oh, Yeah. Um, the worst part is so, um, so I work for Run Bum Tours, Run Bum Races, whatever we're called this time. Uh, Sean Flynn, amazing. Um, we're going through some marketing. So like our website is Run Bum Tours, but our races are all Run Bum Races. So we're getting there. Um, but he's been doing this for 10, 11 years and we've seen it all. Um, you know, you can't, if you flag too soon, your flags are gone. You know, because you're using trails that other people are using. So you've got to flag it just the right amount of time. And no matter how mm -hmm. many flags you put on a course, someone's <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying any names. I'm not saying anything over here. But someone's <laughs> flagging or it's going to go away. Or a cow will eat it and poop it out later because that's... <laughs> Moab. Moab. <laughs> Like, the amount of flagging that gets eaten by cows is insane. Or other animals. And you're just like, why? Or somebody's kid just went and was like, ooh, streamers. And just starts pulling everything off your trees, you know? So we've got mm -hmm. all the complaints. And there's no amount of marking you could do to be like, wrong way. Don't play limbo with this. Please don't do this. And they're going to go that way. Or they're just going to blow past a sign that says wrong way. And another one that says, turn around, you missed it. Like, they just blow <laughs> Like, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Two of <laughs> for these signs. I don't know why you didn't. I don't know. Um, but we see it all. We hear it all. It's, we're a cupless race. So when people get to an aid station, they don't have a cup. We're like, get on here. It's like, get under the coat because we're right. going to pull off. And they're like, why don't, why don't you have a cup? And we're like, we said it 400 times. We're a cupless race. It's an email that you got. It's on the website that you signed up at. It's everywhere. Yeah. It's um, yes. uh, one thing. Uh, what is like? What is one thing that you think that people who run your uh, run races kind of like overlook about like race directing? Um, I think a lot of times they think there is a team of like at least fifty people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know how they think races are um, magically put on, um, but usually it's not a ton of people unless it is like a giant, um, you know, like destination races. Like Candace has got a team of a billion people because her races are massive. So you have to have that support. A lot of times our races aren't that far um, 
driving wise but running wise you're in this big circle forest and you're going on these little out and backs and lollipops and everywhere and so we don't have a giant there's not 54 people out here like making sure you're going the right way um a lot of times i mean us it's a team of three we have wendy on the email she's doing all of our you know email blasts and making sure our older sign up is all taken care of i'm over here running food and beverage services and sean's out here creating courses so there's three masterminds for this and so when People, the worst thing, I think people think that you can answer emails on a Friday before a Saturday race. And I'm just like, yeah, let me just take out a time. Let me just go over here and be like, yeah, sure, I'll come. No. Like, we have no email services on Fridays, guys, before a race. Don't you? Here's, here's the thing about that, right? So somebody might react and say, well, just get more people. And you say, sure, I'll go get more people. But your registration just went from 200 to 300 because you yeah. got to pay for people, too. Like, it'd be great if everything was free. But it's, right, there are costs to putting on these events. Um, I think athletes just forget that. And mind you, you, here's a list of the things that you do in the, in the five minute conversation that we had. In addition to all of this stuff, right? Like you're doing a million different things, people. Like have some grace. Yeah. Just, like, they're doing the best that they can. And yeah. not for trail racing, it should be sort of like, oh my God, I was supposed to run 50 miles and I ran 50.7 because I made a wrong turn or it's trail racing. You're out in the wilderness. Have fun. Like, enjoy this stuff. Yes. And that's, you know, we, none of us that are involved, I don't think any race director out there that runs a trail event is out here for the money. Um, I think we make enough to make our expenses and keep a little bit of profit in case like our arch blows a hole in it. We've got to buy a new one, you know, things like that. or permits are going to go up next year or the cost of goods has gone up astronomically. What we charged for a shirt last year is probably almost doubled this year and we might or might not get them in time, you know, even if you're ordering two months in advance. Um, so the logistics that have gone on, you know, supply chain has messed up everybody. Mm -hmm. and um, we still haven't seen the runners still aren't coming back as much as they were pre, you know, 2020. Um, everyone's kind of like laxed off on training or maybe gotten out of ultra running or trail running. And they're just slowly coming back now. We're seeing a lot more um, gain in our shorter distances, like our half marathons and our six milers and five milers. But then also your volunteers. I don't know anybody who's filling up their volunteers like that. When they open up a sheet, they're like, hey, who wants to volunteer? And you're like, Hey, Aunt Edna, will you please come run an aid station? Because I need somebody for this Saturday. Like, yeah, it's we've, a lot. we've had races. We've talked to races who have had to cancel events because they didn't have enough volunteers as well. Like, it's a big to do. Yeah, I mean, not every event is the New York City Marathon with 50,000 people, right? Like, some of these events have 100 people, 150 people that are being put on by two or three people for an entire year's worth of stuff. So, my advice to all of you athletes watching this, have some grace, okay? Yes. yes. Uh, Everybody, thank you. Like, I am the athlete. I just raced this past weekend. I did a 12K, which was a points point. And I was like, I'd run past the water tables. I didn't need anything because it's a 12K. But I was like, thank you, volunteers, for being out here because it was 39 degrees in South, you know, well, we're in Alabama at that time. But we don't get that cold up here. So everyone's bumped up, handing out water cups. And I'm like, thanks for being out here. Just that little bit, like, just thanking your volunteers. Thank your volunteers. That's your second piece of advice for everybody watching. <laughs> yeah, I think that volunteering, um, somebody, it was really funny. Somebody at Destination Trails was like, how do you train for a 200? And they're like, oh, just volunteer for one of Candace's races. That's a great way to train for a 200. Yes. Like train, like either volunteer or somebody. crew somebody is, crewing is way harder than racing. It is so <laughs> stressful. It is so stressful. You're like, oh, I should expect my runner to be here at 630. And yeah. then they're not there at 630. You're like, oh, where are they? Did something happen? Are they okay? You know, yeah. me, you know, for all I know, they took a dirt nap while they were, you know, cruising along. It happens. <laughs> yep. Or they got lost in an aid station somewhere. They <laughs> load the map and they have no idea where they're going because it's dark out. Or they've been up for, you know, two days and now they're off seeing stars, you know. <laughs> 
But then you have to make sure, number one, are they here? Okay, so they're here. Do you need to sit down? Do you need to change your shoes? Do you need to change your socks? Do you need nutrition? Are you okay? Like, what is my name? <laughs> right. Like, it's, and then you're responsible for holding their human while you're trying to keep yourself fed yep. and make sure you have a bathroom and make sure you're sleeping. Yeah, anytime I've had, like, a crew or somebody pacing me or somebody, I'm like, make sure you take care of yourself, too, because it will – you might not feel it on the first day because you're just hanging around, but it will catch up with you later on. And a lot of places, like, it's, <clears throat> hey, go to Waffle House and turn right. It's like, here's some GPS coordinates. Go off into the wilderness, and there's where you're going to find your runner. And you're like, are we even <laughs> going on? <laughs> Pop out, hopefully get signal, and then you're like, oh, this is an aid station. Here, we just park on the side of the road and go find this little person. And, yeah, it's hard. For those of you that are just joining us, my name is Jason Bahamani. I'm the founder and one of the co-owners of Run, Try, Bike magazine, being joined by our other co-founder, Om Gandhi. And we are talking to Kim Crapeshaw, who, amongst other things, is an athlete, a business owner, dietitian, and a race director. So if you have questions for any one of those categories or you just want to ask her a question, hit the little question mark on the bottom right-hand side. We'll make sure we, we get that asked. Um, Kim, you mentioned the uh, Eversting event. Give yes. us a bit of information about one how did that come to be why what was it like are you going back since your iron man scenario was one and done is that a one and done too um so uh 29 29 everesting is a jesse event and mark hudelik and colin o'brady created it in 2017 so this year was actually its fifth birthday um so I signed up for it in October of 2019, just came out of another stupid relationship and I needed something for myself. Um, so I was like, all right, I'm dropping money on myself. I'm going to do this. And then uh, that big, lovely pandemic happened and all of our training, we were thinking we were going to get to go. We were thinking we were going to get to go and Utah said, forget it. Um, so none of the events happened in 2020. They all went virtual. So I actually did this event twice for the cost of once. Um, so I still went to Utah and met like two of my new best friends. I knew nobody doing 29 or 29, not a single person. I was doing it for me. I didn't care what anybody else said. Um, and I met the most amazing people at this event. Like I have two new best friends. I have two basically brothers. Um, so in 2021, I ended up hiking mountain with my two brand new brothers. Um, we literally met that weekend for the first time face to face. And we were like, we're hiking the mountain together. And we're like, yes, we are. Um, Cause a lot of people hike it by themselves, which is absolutely cool. Um, but that's a really boring 36 hours. If you don't talk to anybody and you're just alone in your thoughts. Like, I mean, I can be, I can do that at home. You know, I can go climb on something by myself for 36 hours. Um, the coolest about thing about 29 or 29 is the people by far. Um, you, if anybody believes in like energy of people, which I am fully 100%, people vibrate on different frequencies. And like, you really want to be around people who vibrate on that frequency. That's like that next level. Um, 29 out of 29 is one of those events. Like, yeah, it's got a steep price tag, but I think it's worth it for what you get out of it. Um, the people there are unlike no other you'll find. You'll find the most amazing Olympic athletes um, from all over the place that are just crushing this mountain to stay at home moms who finally want to do something for themselves to like husband and wife, brother and sister, aunt and cousin, you know, all these things to Jim was like 70 something years old climbing this mountain. And you're like, shoot. All right. I, if Jim's do, I, Jim's not taking a break. I'm not taking a break either. Forget this. Um, but you climb up the account, the amount of Everest that's each event. We've had them all over the place. Uh, the one I did was in Snow Basin, Utah. I have, this year I went to Whistler. We, Whistler was our first year there. Um, and I just volunteered. I had a flight fiasco, so I got in later than I wanted to. But I got to hike that mountain. It's a four-mile hike. So it's a very long one, but it's gorgeous. So you hike the amount of Everest, and then you gondola down. So you don't have to do the screaming downhills. Because your knees would be destroyed. Yeah. Um, you have it's awful. I did it at Vermont. I just came back from Vermont last month where I volunteered again. Um, and then I hiked up the mountain with a few people because they're now allowing some of us that are alumni to kind of like skadoodle up the mountain as well. Um, Mark might watch this and say never again, but who knows. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so I actually hiked up with one of our participants uh, up the mountain to get her up the mountain a little bit and try to get her her red hat. So your next to last lap here is your red bib lap. So, um, or not actually that's your last lap is your red bib lap. So you're walking up, you're hiking up the mountain in your red bib. Everyone knows this is your final lap. Our lap. The last lap is free. You've done all the work. All you have to do is a celebration. So everyone I tell whenever I volunteer, I'm like, all right, this is your red bib lap. Like, make sure you bring someone else up this mountain and get them closer to their red bib. It is all about community, 100%. Like, once you finish and you get your red hat, you might go get some food. You might get cleaned up. You might live at the top of the mountain, make the tunnel for people finishing. Like, you want everybody to finish. It is one of those events that's just well done. Um, and I think everyone who needs that big push should totally do this event, 100%. Or volunteer. Just be on the mountain with these people. It's incredible. That's awesome. So but then to answer your question, I think I'm going to do this year. I think, I think next year. Because we're going to Jackson. We're going to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, and we're doing Snow King Mountain. And I think it's, it's only one mile up. So it's going to be super vert. So it's 19 ascents. So it's going to be hot and heavy, dirty, and I think I'm I'm think I'm there for it. Man, well, <laughs> I, love, I love what you said about um, community and just like, it, isn't it crazy when like this happened with Trans Rockies too? Isn't it crazy when you meet people that it blows your mind away when you meet people that are on the same wave on that same frequency with you? Yeah. Um, like it's true in ultra running, and it definitely seems to be true in twenty nine twenty nine as well. Yeah, like Trans Rockies was a, a pretty dope event. Um, actually significantly cheaper than 29 or 29. So if anybody wants to go and do that event, it's incredible. Um, we did it, that's how we met. I power walked right by you and then you ran <laughs> by me. Um, but then we rode the bus together and had a great conversation and realized we're kind of the same people, which is that's when you find that energy from other people, you just are attracted to it. And you're like, I need to know this person. This person might not be like, the most important person in the world, but they are to me and I need to know this person. And I think that's super cool about all these big events that like just bring people together for long amount, long amount of time where you can see people multiple times. Like a lot of times in a hundred miler, you might see the same people once or twice and then you're like alone in your thoughts for a while. But these events, mm -hmm. Trans Rockies, we saw different people every day. We might see the same people roughly, but still other times we saw different people, but we all saw each other at camp and then yeah. 29 where everyone's just different times because someone might go to the recovery room or they might actually go eat lunch or they might whatever so you just got infiltrated with different people on the mountain so it's just like you just got to feel that energy and be around those new souls and it was so cool you kind of just hit the nail on the head for our business and our platform right is we're building a community of people that may not be the most important people but they're the most important people to us and yeah. you are now part of our family and we love having that type of energy radiate, not only through this conversation, but if, you, if you're watching this and you're not subscribed to our newsletter, go to our website and subscribe to it because Kim's got an article coming out in our uh, November, December digital magazine, which will get dropped tomorrow. So uh, make sure you sign up and feel that energy. Kim, yeah. <laughs> so we don't want to you got some jobs you need to do. So we're gonna go and uh, Jump into our, what we call rapid fire, but take your time to think about the answers if you need to. You ready? Okay. Sure. So, first things first. Pizza. Is pineapple on pizza acceptable or not acceptable? Acceptable. All right. We're no longer friends. You can find her energy in own side of the business. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I like it. I mean, I, I'm not going to ask for it every time, but I'm not going to be like, get off of there. Yeah. Yeah, I won't even ask for it. It just doesn't belong there. But I, I, I'm, I'm a native New Yorker. So when you say there's no bad foods, there's, that's a bad food. Like, that doesn't <laughs> belong. <laughs> Nothing. All food fits. Comes to pizza. Are you New York style, Chicago style, or uh, Detroit style? Oh, God. I don't even know the difference. Whatever is the most doughy deliciousness, that's what I eat. Uh, so I don't know. Well, I she, really, I, pizza's not my big food. I'm not a pizza person. Chicago's a tomato soup bowl, so that would be the most doughy bread. <laughs> you out on that? I don't like a lot of tomato. Like, so my, my family's from Pennsylvania, and they, um, 
there's this rectangle pizza. Like that's how it, it looks like. It looks like it comes out on like a cafeteria style like tray, but it's a yeah. rectangle pizza and it's super light tomato sauce, but like a billion different cheeses. And I'm like, that is my jam. Um, <laughs> I'm just here for cheesy bread with like the idea of tomato. Might um, be. That yeah, that's me. I like so, bread. So we just had Halloween just passed. So, is candy corn a real candy? I mean, I eat it. Like I'm the one person in the store buying candy corn, but I buy the harvest mix. Um, so that it has the little brown ones in there and the regular ones and the pumpkins because Brian eats the snot out of the pumpkins. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yvonne, no. you're not comment. Yvonne agrees with you. <laughs> peeps? Are peeps a candy? Yes or no? Oh. Is it a candy? It's a it's a marshmallow. Um Are you do you enjoy them? Do you eat them? I haven't eaten one in a while, but I'll tell you what I like more than eating them is peep jousting. <laughs> What? You take two peeps and you put like, if this is the peep, you take a toothpick in it and you shove it in there and then you put them on a microwave safe plate and you put them facing each other and then you nuke them. And then you this is the first. <laughs> that song, which is going to joust the other one first before you explode your microwave. You guys have never done peep jousting? Oh. It's taken us 32 episodes to get to this on a fireside chat. <laughs> I'm 31. Am I not 31? Episodes? 31. It's taken us more than 30 episodes to get to peep jousting. <laughs> I mean, the crazy thing we heard about peeps was people were like, oh, you, I love them, but only when they're stale. I'm like, so you like chewing rocks? Like, I don't understand stale peeps. And now we've got peep jousting. This is yeah. amazing. I mean, peeps are good if you want to throw them in like hot chocolate or something. Um, I don't really know. I wouldn't eat them. They're not like, I'm not like, Ew, yay, little rainbow colored marshmallow. No. Just speaking of marshmallows. Yeah, they're marshmallows. So they're not really candy. When you put them over the open fire, do you roast them until they're like charcoal briquettes or just lightly tanned? Oh, uh, lightly tanned. I don't, bur I hate when my marshmallow catches on fire. I'll just fling it back in there and be like, I'm done. Um, I do not like the soot covered marshmallows. Like, I'm just like, just please toast it. Like, yeah. I'm gonna have this conversation you're eating candy corn you're putting pineapple on your pizza and you want a slightly toasted marshmallow like i want to peel the charcoal off and have that molten center for afterwards i mean um, i would molten center but i you can have the charcoal part i'll eat the molten in the center i could live off the elf diet so basically don't ask me if things are candy because i'll eat it um <laughs> i'll say yes and it's edible so you know is red velvet a real flavor I mean, or, it's it's on menus, but it's really just cake with red food dye, right? I mean, let's be honest. Yes, yes, pretty much. <laughs> Are you a cake person or a pie person? Which do you prefer? It would depend on what I was being offered at the time. Because there are cakes that I'm like, get that out of here. I don't want it. And there are pies that I'm like, please remove. I don't want that either. Um, pecan what? pie? not out of I only eat my own pumpkin pie that I make because it's from scratch like I literally roast the pumpkin it's not out of a can um so I won't go anywhere I'm really snotty about key lime pie because I live in Florida so um I don't want to go to the midwest and they're like key lime pie and I'm like from where where'd this come from <laughs> that's like when they offer you seafood on a landlocked like somewhere up there and you're like where did this come from this is not fresh I know this is not fresh so then you understand, like, eat when you're eating pizza, that's not in New York. It's already subpar. It's right. Already yeah. But like, I, I mean, I just like cheesy bread. So, like, don't, I don't want, you know, <laughs> go either way with pizza, whatever. So you're Ironman athlete, triathlete, you're a runner. So you, when you're out there training, not in the swim section, but cycling or running, are you listening to music? the sound of your feet and breath or podcasts? I listen to uh, myself, my breathing and my foot strike. I listen to no music 
I really recommend that my athletes not listen to music either, especially when they're trying to train for certain things because certain music will get you running at like faster speeds or slower speeds or whatever because you're paying attention to that versus what you're actually doing. So I really like to focus on removing all of the noise that's not yourself. Podcasts are cool. Like if you're at an event where like you're going to be out there alone by yourself for forever, then like put on a podcast, whatever, get eaten by animals. I don't care. Um, <laughs> we have people who are like, I put on my ears for like nighttime and I'm like, you're not worried about what's going to eat you out here. You just want to not hear that and just die. Okay, cool. Um, but I really like people to be in their surrounding. Like if you're going to run in the middle of like the most beautiful places on earth, like listen to that music like listen to the nature as your soundtrack like i'm really like be where your feet are and really enjoy that moment and you might find some clarity with yourself too like maybe you have some things you need to work on mm -hmm. and you work on those things without like britney spears coming at you you know, you know like we all have something to work on let's, let's not kid ourselves there's a lot of problems like we solved on the trail honestly yeah, right. bucket list race what's an event you haven't done that you keep telling yourself i've got to get to that at some point Leadville 100. That was easy. So when are you going to register for the lottery or? Uh, in a couple, next week, next two weeks, somewhere like that. Yeah. Have you been registered for it and just not been fortunate? I for it because I've been, you know, failing at hundreds right now and I didn't feel like I should put myself in there. And then since we did Hope Pass when we were at Trans Rockies, I was like, well, this part's going to suck, but I, I could. Sucks. So I'm like, well, you know, might as well throw my name in. And then my other half, of course, is a mountain biker. So he wants to do Leadville 100 mountain bike. So we're just going to live in Leadville. But we'll see who gets in the lottery and who has to die. Well, if I'm volunteering at Trans Rockies, I guess I'll see you at Leadville. <laughs> awesome. Well, Kim, thank you so much. And before I let you go, let the audience know where they can find you if they're interested in dietitian consulting or running coach or what was it CrossFit level one coaching? Where can yeah. they find you? So you can find me. I am of course on Instagram as mud runner chick. I am on Facebook as well. You can find me at Kim Crapeshaw, but I really don't post much there, but on my mud runner chick page on Facebook, you can find me where there's a little bit more heartfelt posts and things like that. And then my website is um, MRC nutrition and wellness.com. And there you can find out about my coaching services. You can apply to work with me and then we can get started together. Um, and you can see kind of the, some of the things that I offer. I have a blog. I really don't update it much. I'm sorry. I'm out doing 8 million things, but I will get better at that. Maybe. While she might not be blogging, she did write an article for us. So go to our website, runtrymag.com. Subscribe to our newsletter. It'll be dropping tomorrow. You'll get her nutrition article. Um, or if you stay here on Instagram, just click the little link tree and there's a button there to subscribe to our newsletter and uh, you'll get it delivered to you tomorrow. Kim, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. We'll have to have you back on once the lottery for Leadville gets pulled and you're in. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I will definitely be back on for that. But it's been a pleasure. Thank you guys so much. Thanks. Have a great night. Thanks. Bye.